That's good. The Shamatha Project has quite a long history. I was first trained in this range of meditative practices designed to make the mind, set the mind at ease, bring about a sense of calm, of presence, of inner serenity, of focus, but also just a, the opposite of slipping into a kind of trance-like state, rather slipping into a state of increasing wakefulness, vigilance, alertness. So I was trained in this for the first time when I was studying in Dharamsala, India, in the early 70s. And I was exposed to a wide variety of theories and practices in Tibetan Buddhism, and I was being taught as if I was a Tibetan. So there was like major culture shock as I was exposed to this. Uh, and as gradually as the years went over, then it started to make more and more sense. But one thing that leapt out at me in my very early training as just making enormously good sense from any perspective was the training in shamatha, the focusing, the development of attention. And I said, whatever else, that is definitely, that's worth doing. You know? So I was very drawn to that from the very beginning. And after 10 years of a lot of training through the 70s, then went off and spent about four years in a series of meditative retreats, most of them solitary. Uh, went back finally after 14 years out of Western civilization, finished my undergraduate degree in physics, and then I just went back into retreat again. But during these years when I was in Amherst College and then traveling to the West Coast, actually up to Seattle, I was thinking how meaningful it could be to set up a one-year group retreat, a shamatha retreat. And I let the word out in a Dharma talk very much like this, very, very similar. And a couple of people said, good idea, you know, let's do that. And so we did. I organized it, and we invited over an, an utterly marvelous Tibetan yogi by the name of Genlam Rinpa, very much my senior, my te- one of my very beloved and revered teachers. He had spent about, at that time, maybe 25 years in solitary retreat. So I felt, let him be the teacher for this retreat. I'll be his intern, I'll be his assistant, but bring the master from the Himalayas. <laughs> so we brought him there, and I had just come out of a, uh, about a nine-month period of solitude up in the eastern Sierras, and then I joined with him beginning of 1988, so almost 20 years ago. And this was a lot of preparation. Twelve people just put their lives on hold, devoted themselves to meditation, solitary, med- well, a group meditation retreat for one year under his guidance, and then I was again his intern, his assistant, his translator. And even then, for that one, I thought how interesting it would be to have some type of monitoring of what happens when people meditate 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day for a whole year. What happens? You know? They will know what happens. And then when I'm speaking with them, I'll get some idea. Genlam Rimba, being their primary teacher, he got a very good idea. But what would that look like scientifically? And I'd already gotten to know quite a renowned um, scientist who'd studied meditation. At that time, he was one of the very few, Herbert Benson at Harvard. When I was at Amherst College, I met him. He came out to see me at Amherst. And when he heard about the Shamat retreat back in 88, he said, can I come? You know, that is not to be in the retreat, but he was very eager to come and study these very odd people you know, that would want to meditate for a whole year. And um, he had done good research on the relaxation response. Some of you might know this book that came out like 25 years ago. But I really felt this is Genlam Rimba's retreat. I've organized it. I've worked with all the people to arrange this, but he's the teacher. And so I simply brought this to him. I said, there's a you know, Harvard scientist, MD, very open-minded, very interested in meditation. He would like to do some monitoring, some measures of our 12 retreatants here. What do you think, boss? You know, should we allow this? But it's your call. Whatever you decide, that goes. And Yen Lam Rimba had not, had not had a lo- lot of exposure to West, Western civilization. In fact, his exposure to Western civilization was pretty much me. <laughs> Because I would spent about six months, or almost, well, a little bit, just a bit shy of six months in solitary retreat right near his cabin. And so that's when he met his first gringo, you know, that he could actually speak with. Because I, I was fluent in Tibetan, so he got to know me, and so I was Western civilization for him. Uh, he had a very steep learning curve when he was in this country. I find that not everybody's as weird and oddball as I am. Um, but he thought this over very carefully, and he said, scientific studies be very interesting, but we don't know 
how much the how much impact there would be on the meditators by having the scientists hooking them up and asking questions and maybe doing other kinds of measurements, how much will that impact and possibly detract from their meditative practice? We don't know that. So he said, it would be interesting, let's not do it now. For this first one, and he's already thinking ahead, for this first one, this one-year retreat, small number of people, just a dozen, let's leave out the science. And let's just see what happens when 12 well, Western meditators plunk down and really devote themselves to practice, leave out the science, but then we'll know what it's like without science. And then, manana, manana. Sometime in the future, you want to do another one, then you can do a science thing. So that was almost 20 years ago. So this was in my mind for more than 20 years. How meaningful it could be in so many ways to do a study like this and then have just cutting edge absolutely state-of-the-art scientific measures of a nice richness, diversity, whole range of measures. So that was just percolating. And I, and I collaborated with scientists, neuroscientists, for a long time. And I would, I would drop it out there once in a while and say, you know, I've had this idea for a shamatha project. And they'd say, hmm, interesting. And they'd walk away. You know? So this went on for years and years and years. But back in 1992, just to give you a little bit more history, and then we'll jump right into the project. In 1992, from, ni- from 1990 to 1992, We'd had two mind and life conferences. These are me- meetings with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, with top-notch scientists. And um, so in 1990, we raised this issue with Richard Davidson, with Francisco Varela, our, our late and very dear friend, with Cliff Sarin, Greg Simpson, and then I. And we thought, what, why don't we as a team, and I would be the cultural liaison, liaison, the interpreter, and so forth, the guy who knows Buddhism, why don't we do a study of Tibetan yogis? So we did a study back in 1992. We hiked up into the hills with all of our equipment up, and up into the, mount, the Himalayas, up above Dharmasala. We found yogis that would actually collaborate with us and be willing to put on EEG caps and so forth. And that was a whole story. That could be an evening, but I won't go there. But I got to know these scientists very well, and Cliff Sarin especially, at that time. And uh, so that again was more seeds. And then the years went by. The years went by. I did my doctorate at Stanford, and then I kept on mentioning, you know, every year or two I'd mention, well, there could be a Shamata project. And about five years ago, I mentioned it to Cliff, Cliff Sarin, very, very bright uh, cognitive neuroscientist, and his special area of, of research is attention. He does multiple things. He does also uh, auto- uh, autism. autism. Um, but attention was a very keen interest of his. And I mentioned it to him, and, he, and his eyes lit up and said, good idea. So he went back to his, his academic home base, University of California at Davis, and he started talking about it with his, with his colleagues there, and some of them very, very eminent scientists. Ron Mangan, the director of the Center for Mind and Brain at UC Davis, uh, Dr. Philip Shaver, the chair of psychology at Davis, and then other just really outstanding psychologists and neuroscientists. And the momentum started to grow, thinking, that is so weird, you know, the scientists think. Well, and we were thinking at that time of doing a one-year retreat. And the scientists were into it. They said, good. Let's, have a bunch of people meditate for a year, let's, let's go for it. And we had a meeting at MIT in 2003, and at that point, I remember it very clearly, at that point, the, the head scientists there at UC Davis, they went public, and they said, we're back in this thing. So Ron Mangan, with a whole Center for Mind and Brain, a very prestigious center at UC Davis, he said, we're doing the Shamata Project. Philip Shaver sent out a message to all of his professors and all the graduate students in this very large psych department and said, we're doing the Shamata project. Once you make it public, you don't go back. And so the ball st- really started rolling slowly, but it was really rolling in 2003. And then my task was to find a suitable place for it and then find out whether anybody would actually want to sign up for such a thing. And then science, as any of, any of you who are scientists, you know good science is very expensive. And so we were thinking of a one-year retreat, and that would have been for the science over $2 million dollars to do a decent study, all the data analysis. But a major catch here, just for room and board, we, didn't, we never found any place that would be cheaper than about $60 a night for room and board, for a single room and three meals a day. I looked and looked and looked. Basically no place for less than $55, $60 a night. 